uh, on two of the top base in architecture. First one be on quality of service and predictable memory. And the next uh, guest lecture will be on compression in, in memory compression. <coughs> um, before that, uh, let me make some announcements. Uh, as you guys are fully aware, the term to come next Wednesday. Me turn to it. Yeah, one. <laughs> if that, that's a good response. I like that. Uh, it's likely it's going to be hard as usual, or maybe more than usual. Who knows? Hopefully it's not too bad. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, last day is to Sunday night. If you have late days, burn it. <laughs> if you have late days and you have other projects, and figure out your schedule. But late days there for you if you help. And one thing that might help a lot when you debug your memory is you, you might want to have a wrapper function that actually disable the cache. That's one thing that makes a little life a lot easier. Just write and load a store in, in the assembly file such that it just access the memory directly. So you just like say it's activated the rank and just debug. It's just easier to debug if you somehow struggle to debug your memory. But if you have two little cache those the two things you'll choose there some feel like. It is some tricks that might help. It might not help. Um, it, depending on how you lay out your code right now, but it can get hacky at this point. Make sure you clean up a little bit after you submit that thing so that there will be more much more ego and it builds on top of that thing. She knows because she 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 is about two years ago. And how long you spend debugging that seven? Quite a while. Uh, yeah, and, and couple of couple of years. We <laughs> spent quite a while debugging lab seven. Yeah. That's, that's so lab seven is coherence. Right? Yeah. We, we, well, I kind of wish we can just eliminate some of the requirements. Really. <laughs> 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 um, yeah, that that homework seven is due on the last week of class, and next Monday I believe will be a review session, so come with questions. A lot of questions. Yeah. It'll be mostly driven by you guys. So any topic that you're not sure that you get scared to show up in exam on the exam somehow, ask away so that you're more careful with it. Or at least know how to approach the question. Okay. And yeah. So the first talk would be on uh, quality of service and predictable. So my name is Bernie. I'm one of the students on this group. And she worked mostly on providing a predictable uh, performance for each application and also providing quality of service across different applications when they're running together in a sense. Here's the talk. Okay, thanks, Rachata. So, I, like Rachata said, I work in honors group. I'm his PhD student. Uh, a lot of my work so far has been on memory systems, uh, managing memory, uh, how do we manage the main memory when there are multiple applications interfering, how do we ensure good performance, fairness, and more recently, some kind of performance predictability. I I'll talk about that as I go into the talk. But the way my talk is going to be structured is I'll talk about, briefly talk about the problem of memory interference itself at the beginning which I hear you guys are reasonably familiar with from some of the previous classes. And then I'll talk about uh, a memory schedule design that I worked on a little while ago. And then I'll move into uh, this notion of predictable performance and how we try and provide that with memory interference. So you guys have probably seen a, uh, a figure like this in a lot of uh, owner's lectures. There are multiple cores today in uh, multi-core systems, and they share resources such as caches and main memory. And when there's such sharing, uh, there clearly uh, is degradation in performance compared to when there's no such sharing, or when an application is run alone by itself and is given all these resources to itself. And clearly, this, uh, this interference has some impact, and the impact is uh, application performance. right? Or more concretely, uh, the application slow down uh, heavily and also unpredictably in the presence of interference, memory interference and shared cache interference. Let's look at that with an example here. So there are two plots here. On the left, I show two applications, Leslie 3D and GCC. These are from a standard benchmark suite that we use for our evaluations, uh, typical architecture evaluations. 
these two applications are run on the two cores of a two core system. The cores are separate, there, there's no sharing at the core level. But then these two applications share caches and main memory, like the plot I showed earlier. Same here, just that the two applications are different, there's Leslie 3D and MCF here. So now what happens is uh, uh, what happens here? What do you observe here? What happens to each application? Yeah, that's a that's a good observation. So I guess first, uh, I guess the simpler observation is that different applications slow down uh, and they experience different slowdowns. Sure. But then the other more interesting observation like he pointed out is that if you look at Leslie 3D alone here, it, it slows down differently when it's run with uh, any, uh, the, it, when it, it slow down really depends on whom it's running with. So an application's performance really depends on whom it's running with and tackling that and trying to see if we can provide some notion of predictability irrespective of whom it's running with is going to be part of this talk, but that's going to be the second part of this talk. First, I'll talk about tackling this problem, which is there are high application slowdowns just due to interference, and how do we tackle that? That's going to be the first part of this talk. So I guess uh, I'll talk about this piece, the blacklisting memory scheduler first, and the second piece on predictable performance next. That's the outline. So first, let's dive into the uh, blacklisting memory scheduler. So I guess before I do that, I'll refresh your memory on uh, how the DRAM main memory system is organized. Uh, you, uh, so you, are you guys familiar with this stuff? OK. So there's the me memory controller on the chip that talks through a channel to a bunch of banks. So the banks are rows and columns. And each bank has its row buffer, right? And what does this row buffer do? When a piece of data is accessed from the array, the entire row containing that piece of data is brought into the row buffer. So typically, when you make a request to the memory, it's for a cache block. But then the row size is about 4 kilobytes or so. So the entire 4 kilobytes is brought in, even when you request a cache block of, say, 64 bytes. So now, when a subsequent access requests data from the same row, it can be served from the row buffer itself and need not access the memory array. This is called a row buffer hit. And, uh, why, and on the other hand, if, let's say, data is accessed from a different row, the subsequent access uh, goes to a different row, then the current row's contents need to be written back, and a new row has to be brought into the row buffer. Uh, probably stuff you're familiar with, but I'm going over it just as a uh, refresh. So this is called a row buffer miss, right? So c considering you guys have seen this, uh, uh, can you think of what people do in memory scheduling to take advantage of row buffers and row hit behavior? Anyone? Yeah, exactly. So that's what previous schedulers do. FRFCFS uh, are the first ready, first come, first serve scheduler. Prioritizes row buffer hits and then takes older requests next. So while, so why is this done? I mean, so what does prioritizing row buffer hits gets us, get us? It gets us uh, good bandwidth utilization. So your memory, let's say there's just one application running on a system, right? And it has a bunch of row buffer hits and misses. It makes a lot of sense to prioritize all the row buffer hits first in this scenario. But then, when you have multiple applications running on the same system, and that's the resource sharing scenario that I described earlier, uh, a policy like this can be unaware of interference between applications, right? So when I, uh, so there, there has been previous work that has taken, a, taken uh, tried to take this into account and uh, schedule for that. So I guess you guys are familiar with some of the application aware memory schedulers from earlier, right? Is that a yes? Yes, okay. So uh, the principles behind a lot of these schedulers is to monitor applications' memory access characteristics, like memory access intensity, row buffer locality, whatever it is, and then rank, perform some kind of ranking based on these characteristics. And then finally, at the memory controller, prioritize requests such that the ranking is obeyed, and higher ranked applications' requests are given priority. Right. So these are just some guiding principles that a lot of schedulers use. So which schedulers do you guys remember using these? principles. Anyone remembers any of them? Names? OK. You, so just to get a sense, so this was covered fairly quickly in class, Rachata? Or? So we talk about the performance okay. I see. OK. OK, sure. So I guess let me talk about one memory scheduler 
that does this uh, very briefly. So this is called thread cluster memory scheduling. If you, and you guys are supposed to know this. Yeah. <laughs> okay, you don't know this. Okay, so if you guys don't know this, I'll breeze past it quickly. Uh, it, it really follows the principles that we looked at here earlier, right? Monitor, rank, and prioritize requests at the memory controller. So thread cluster memory scheduling, or TCM, looks at all the threads in the system and first classifies them based on memory intensity. So, if, uh, so a lot of previous work on application-aware memory scheduling observed that memory intensity or the rate at which an application accesses memory is a first order uh, citizen uh, that needs to be considered, right? Because when an application has a large number of requests to memory, it can stall other applications that don't have as many requests to memory. So that's what TCM also observes and does as the first step, classifies them and puts them in two different clusters. Now, the non-intensive cluster, like I said just a minute back, has a tendency to experience a lot of interference and get deprioritized and get stalled, right? And the other thing is also the non-intensive cluster or uh, applications generally have few requests outstanding. So prioritizing those few requests enables them to make fast progress compared to these guys who always have a bunch of requests outstanding and they anyway stall at memory and they wait for memory for long periods of time. So why not pick these applications that would benefit some, from some kind of priority and prioritize them? So that's the first step. And the non-intensive cluster is always prioritized over the intensive cluster. Then TCM goes one step further and does a few more things. I'm not going into too many details, but this is basically ranking between applications by memory intensity here and shuffling between uh, different applications, uh, priorities, and rankings. These achieve two different goals. Let's not focus too much on those uh, uh, dirty details of the mechanism itself. Uh, let's stay at a fairly high level. So that's what TCM does, right? So that's TCM, and there have been other schedulers in the past also that do one or part of this, which is, uh, let's say, just prioritize low intensity applications, or let's just, let's just say rank based on memory intensity, and so on. Right? So now, let me pause here and ask you guys if you see any downsides to using a scheduler like this. So the upside clearly is that it is aware of inter-application interference. Right? Unlike FRFCFS, which just prioritizes row hits and maximizes memory bandwidth, schedulers like this are aware of inter-application interference. But what are the downsides? Mm -hmm. so, like, where do you think that threshold will kind of affect of how, um, like, the higher priority ones that you put up there, and whether or not mm -hmm. they're still being memory intensive? Mm -hmm. that, that, that's a good one, yes. Uh, there's a robustness concern in the sense of where you draw the line really affects uh, these decisions you make and how much do you impact applications in either of the clusters, right? If you, let's say, draw the line at the wrong place and you put a high intensity application in this cluster, that's going to always get prioritized and it's going to hurt these guys. So yes, that's a, that's a good point. Uh, let's think a little differently, right? I mean, from what the focus of this class has been. Uh, how do you implement a scheduler like this in hardware? All this is done in hardware, right? Sure. Right. So you assign them priority, sure. And the final step, I guess, is you you assign this, the way the way it's organized is you have this big request buffer structure that sits in the memory controller, right? And it has this all these requests sitting in them, and you need to do some kind of comparisons to figure out what's the which which application has the highest ranking, and send out a request with the highest ranking, and so on, right? So. What we observe is uh, implementing all this ranking. For those of you who have probably taken like a digital system design or implementation kind of class, you'll probably realize that prioritizing and assigning ranks for a large number of applications. Now think of like 20 applications or 40 applications, right? Doing that kind of priority assignment and ranking over such a large number of applications and cores can, can be fairly complex, right? I mean, you need to do all this in hardware. So that's one of the things we observed. And we really see that there are two problems. First, there's the hardware complexity concern that I just talked about. And then that, that's, there's something similar to what, uh, what's his name? Aaron mentioned, uh, which was about uh, where you draw the line can sometimes be a problem. right? So uh, I'll go into each of these in a little bit more detail in the upcoming slides. 
So ranking has high hardware cost because you need to compute ranks and enforce ranks, like I just said. So if I can throw some numbers at you and convince you of the hardware cost of ranking, here they are. Uh, in terms of latencies, uh, by latency, I mean the length of the critical path for these schedulers, how long it takes to actually schedule a request when these are implemented in hardware, when I write RTL for these and synthesize them. So the latency increases significantly for a TCM-like scheduler compared to FRFCFS because all the ranking and all the prioritization has a cost in hardware. Similarly, area also increases, as we see in this plot. So we're really trying to see, can we avoid, so uh, the, they are the numbers, but uh, you can see that they're large. But what we're really trying to see is, can we avoid ranking to incur a lower, lower hardware cost? That's one of the things we're trying to do here. Second, if we go into the second issue, uh, in some sense, it's partially what you said, but it's also that when you implement a ranking-based mechanism, there's always going to be one application that's ranked higher than some others, right? And when you keep ranking an application over the other for a while, that can hurt the application that ra that's ranked lower, first of all. And second, uh, even periodically moving around these ranks and shuffling them sometimes has an impact as we see. So I have some more details here, but I'm not going to, the, uh, going to go too much into the details. So I really picked two applications from a workload suite and show them here. So this is the execution time or execution time intervals, and the y-axis is the number of requests served during these intervals. So this is what TCM does to this application. If you see, there are these long flat periods when there are no requests served, and that corresponds to when the application has very low priority or very low ranking. And there are these tall spikes that happen when the application has high priority, right? So fundamentally, inherently, with a priority or a ranking-based scheduler, you are bound to have these and these. Sure, I mean, they're going to, you, you would think they're, they'd cancel out eventually, but then we see that does not always happen, right? So we tried another thing where we said, let's just take away the ranking part. Let's prioritize, have a low-intensity cluster and a high-intensity cluster. We, uh, we just do the classification part that's there in TCM. But then let's not do anything more, right? And we tried that. And when we try that, what we see is there aren't as many flat faces, if you can see. You guys still with me? So there are not as many flat faces, and that's because this application is not always deprioritized over any other, right? It could be deprioritized over a bunch of low intensity applications, but then there is no fine grained ranking in that. It's not like every application is either ranked higher or lower than another application, right? So when you take away that kind of a fine-grained ranking, there are benefits to some applications. Some applications, like the one I show on the right, do not benefit, because to start off with, this application did not have much of a problem. And the reason is this application has very high memory access intensity. It generates a bunch of requests always, right? So when you have an application like that, even when it's ranked fairly low, it, it, it still can sneak its request in once in a while, unlike an application like this one, which does not have too many requests outstanding at any point in time. So that's what happens with this application. Let me not go into the details there too much. But overall, what we see is we reduce the slowdown of this application, A star, by around 20%, 25% or so, while increasing the slowdown of another application that's higher intensity by only about 10% or so in this case. And I'm not showing you those results here, but overall, we see that there is benefit to individual applications on the one hand, and also to overall performance and uh, fairness. Uh, are you guys familiar with the notion of fairness? You are, right? So there is benefit to overall performance and fairness when we do a policy that does not do a fine-grained ranking scheme. Rather, it coarsely says, these, are, these applications are vulnerable. Let's protect them. These applications are fairly intensive. So let's quarantine them and not let them interfere with the vulnerable applications. But beyond that, let's not interfere too much in terms of assigning a very strict priority scheme and trying to obey that scheme. So that's why we see that uh, a grouping-like or a simpler scheme can be a higher fairness alternative to a ranking-like scheme, while at the same time being low, uh, low complexity. Right? So really what we're saying is let's design a low complexity, high performance, and fairness scheduler. And if you guys think about it a bit at this point, in terms of principles, we are really borrowing a lot from the principles of TCM or other previous schedulers that you've seen, right? That high intensity applications or applications that generate a large number of requests tend to slow down other applications that do not have as many memory requests outstanding because they're all queued up behind these large number of requests. And so let's prioritize those low intensity applications because they're vulnerable. So that we're really 
we, we still are capitalizing on that observation from TCM or previous schedulers, but then we are really just trying to keep the complexity low and we observe that that can potentially cause unfairness. So, let us take away some part of it while keeping some part of it, that is really the idea here. So, uh, what we propose is uh, uh, let us just do a simple grouping mechanism. Uh, more concretely, the mechanism in, in view of simplicity also is to just monitor the number of uh, an application, uh, look at, at the memory controller, look at the request stream that comes in and when an application has more than n requests served, right? let us say there are 4 requests consecutively from the same application, at that point just, just stop that application's request from being served and put that application in a quarantine or a blacklist. Now, uh, what, uh, what that does is that, that identifies applications that tend to have a large number of requests generated and that are causing interference, right. But then later what do we do with that? We just prioritize requests of applications that have not been blacklisted. And then we periodically clear this blacklist information to uh, enable, uh, to prevent any application from stalling for a very long period of time. Now, I guess you, you I mean, you probably will have questions on a mechanism like that in terms of it makes things very simple, but then how effective is it? Uh, we do see that uh, uh, we, we tried variants of this in terms of introducing a little more complexity, right? So, I mean, can you think of other variants that might have a bit more complexity, but might still work? Here, we're just looking at consecutive requests. What else could you do? So, what are we trying to do here? We are trying to see, identify applications that generate or have a number of requests served. That is what we are trying to do, right. We are trying to really come up with a proxy for memory intensity, the access intensity that is not as uh, intensive, I mean uh, capturing it is not that difficult. So, I guess one thing, okay, let me start, I can, uh, I, we can put, we can put like a counter for every application, right, and say let us just count the number of requests that come in, but then let us not do all this, uh, uh, all this ranking or let us not do too much of this uh, uh, ranking mechanism, but let us just try and say when an application has more than these number of requests served during a window of time, let us just call it intensive, right. When you do it that way, uh, a TCM like, a, a TCM like scheduler, what it really does is it ranks all of them, it looks at memory intensity, sorts them and all that. So, we could come up with other variants that are simpler, but in, in the spirit of this mechanism is really to say, let us come up with simpler schemes that are possibly more implementable when it comes to actually putting it in a real system. Because putting, putting, putting into a real system a more complex scheduler can be hard. So, any, uh, let me stop for a second here and ask if there are any questions. So, the idea of a simpler scheduler makes sense, okay, cool. So, I guess we, we simulate uh, on, a, on, a, on a specific system, let me not go into too many details the methodology. The only thing I would like to point out is memory is the only shared resource here, caches are private. So, applications still have their own caches and any interference at this point is really just from the main memory. And we have a bunch of workloads here. So, let us just look at uh, a bunch of metrics for performance. And when I look at metrics for performance, I will actually uh, uh, diverge a bit from the main topic and talk a bit more about some of these metrics. So, have you looked at any of these previous metrics for performance in any of the lectures earlier? Not this one. So, what have been, what have, what, what, what metrics have you seen? What metrics are you familiar with? Um, I guess we just really haven't talked about like multi-threaded. I see. Okay, for single thread, what's your performance metric that you clock can? Is just like instructions per clock. Right. Yeah. Instructions per clock is an example. What else? I guess execution time is another metric you could use, right? You just run something and see how long it takes. And that's again another metric of performance. But yeah, when we come down to uh, multi-threaded, or these are not really multi-threaded in the sense that all these threads 
are working on different things, right? So we are talking of a scenario where you have a bunch of applications running on different cores. But then let me clarify that the scenario here is really these threads are working towards their own independent objectives. They are not trying to collaborate. Is that that makes sense? That's the scenario we're talking about here. Because even earlier when we looked at these scheduling techniques, we were trying to see which application to prioritize over which other. And we were really thinking of these threads as doing individual their own things and not really collaborating on a common objective. Right. So yeah, he said IPC. That's one measure he talked about, right, for single thread applications. Now when you think about a multi-thread application, uh, 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 when you think about a scenario, let's say where there are two applications running together on the same system, right? Now, I, I ran this, app I, there are applications A and B, let me, I have two cores here, application A, can you see me, the writing? So there's application A here and application B here running on two cores. And the system just has shared memory, let's say, right? Let's forget caches for now. So now this application A, let's say it was run by itself on this system. There was nothing running on this core, okay? And now application A is run along with the other application B, the, this other application B and they're sharing memory. Right? So in this scenario, first of all, what do you think will happen to application A's performance compared to when it was run alone? Decrease. Yeah, it should decrease, sure. So now, we are, uh, what is the metric of performance you talked about, IPC? Right? So you talked about the IPC of the application when it was run alone. That, that's the metric we used to measure its performance when it was run alone. And now we are talking about running it with another application, right? So now let's call this new metric IPC shared. IPC shared. So this IPC alone would be greater than IPC shared like you just said, right? Because it, IPC shared would decrease compared to IPC alone. So now this, of, this is really what we call the slowdown of the application. So it slows down by this much. Let's say it's IPC reduced by half, right? when it was run along with this other application, it slows down by 2, 2x when it's run along with this other application. That's what it means, right? So now, this is with, from the perspective of application A alone. Now, we want a metric that looks at the performance of application A and B together. We want, a, or in other words, we want a composite metric that looks at the performance of all the applications that are run together on a multi-core system. So and that's where these metrics come into play. So this first metric, it's called weighted speed up. Uh, uh, let's forget the name for now, but it's really the sum of the inverse of these slowdowns. So if you think about it, it's really the sum of IPC shared divided by IPC alone of an application. So now IPC shared by IPC alone of an application, what, what range of values would it lie in? What's the maximum value it can take? I'm talking about IPC shared divided by IPC alone. So what range of values can it take? Okay, let's say zero here, I'll, I'll give you that point. So it can go up to the number of cores. No, I'm just looking at IPC shared by IPC alone of one core. Oh, okay. So it can go up to what? One. Yeah, exactly. So it can go up to one. So like, like he said earlier, each of these can go up to one, right? And what we're really doing here is summing all these IPC shared by IPC alone. And they sum totally, when I sum up this over all applications, let's add an i here, where i means application, application i, then it can go all the way up to the number of cores. So that's called the weighted speed up of an application. So really, an, uh, this uh, weighted speed up of, a, uh, of uh, a workload. So workload is really a combination of these different applications that are run together on a system. So let's say there are eight applications run together on a system. The maximum value it can take is eight, right? And now, when, when uh, this maximum value of eight is, is, is highly unlikely, right? Because often when you're interfered with by other applications, your, this factor is going to be less than one. 
Now, there is also another metric that tries uh, uh, that tries to uh, estimate uh, the composite performance of all these applications in a workload and that is called harmonic speed up or really think of it as the harmonic mean of speed ups. So, now the question is what is speed up right. So, I define slow down here. So, speed up is really just the inverse of slow down. So, speed up here is 1 over slow down. or we can write speed up in other way as this factor right IPC shared by IPC alone. So, the harmonic speed up metric is really the harmonic mean of all the speed ups because what the harmonic mean is a, uh, the, the harmonic mean is really n over sum of inverse of each independent quantity. So, you are really taking the inverse of each of these speed ups here summing them up and doing an n over uh, by that whole sum. So, that is the harmonic speed up metric. Now, let us try and understand a little bit more about each of these metrics and what. For, so, so, the problem with the metric always is there are it is prone to some kind of fault right. Meaning in uh, for, for some workloads or in some cases some metrics would work well. In other cases other metrics would work well right. I mean that, that problem always exists with a metric. Let us take the example of instructions per cycle metric right. When you are just looking at an individual uh, uh, when you are when just looking at an individual application running on let us say two machines right. You run it on one machine let us say machine A you run it on another machine machine B. Now, machine A has all these really simple instructions let us say right. It is a risk machine let us say and it has all uh, very simple machines uh, very simple instructions like add subtract and so on. Machine B on the other hand has these fancy instructions, its instruction set is fancy. Let us say it has multiply instructions, it has much more fancy instructions like maybe even floating point instructions and so on right. So, when you look at the IPC on machine B, it is going to be lower because the total number of instructions that the binary made up would be much smaller when you are in the case of machine B. But in the case of machine A, it is going to be higher because it is all these simple instructions right. So, clearly in this case using IPC to compare these two machines is not a sensible thing to do right. So, similarly all these different metrics are prone to their own errors. So, let us just talk about first this metric right the weighted speed up metric it takes the sum of the speed ups is you guys with me on that it takes the sum of the speed ups right. So, what so speed up here I show speed up on the x axis and slow down on the y axis. So, ideally to what the weighted speed up metric try, tries to do is it tries to I mean if you want to optimize for this metric you should try and get as many applications in this region as possible right. The ideal would be to get every application down to here, but that is not going to be possible. So, at least try and push them towards the right as much as you can. But now the problem is as you start pushing some applications towards the right right. If your goal is to push some applications towards the right, then you might be pushing some applications that were here towards the left. And the interesting thing to note down here is when you look at the slowdown, it rises significantly in this region. So, pushing an application from here to here can have a significant increase in terms of slowdown. Its slowdown could go from 4 to 10. Whereas, in this region if you push an application from here to here, its slowdown would not increase that much, but then its speed up would increase by a lot. So, when you are optimizing for a speed up based metric like let us say weighted speed up right, you are prone to the error or you are prone to the fallacy of trying to push applications towards this end of the spectrum while pushing a few applications from here to maybe this end of the spectrum because overall it does not impact the speed up that much right. It does not impact the composite performance that much, but when you look at another metric let us say harmonic speed up here right. So, this is the harmonic speed up metric here. So, really if we have to uh, so this metric is really n over slow down right. So, let me get from a board space. So, the harmonic speed up I will just call it h speed up metric is n over sum of slow downs. So, now for this metric, so this metric takes the uh, uh, has the slow downs in its denominator and it really sums them up right. So, when let us say the slow down of one application shoots up. Let us say we did what the weighted speed up metric does and push one application from to here to here right. So, if you if you push it slow down significantly like the harmonic speed the what the harmonic speed up metric would do is it would its uh, numerator would it, its denominator would increase significantly all in a sudden. 
and that would increase the that would decrease the overall number. So the harmonic speed up of the application would reduce. So really, if you're optimizing for weighted speed up, you tend to push a lot of applications here at the cost of pushing a few applications here. If you're optimizing for the harmonic speed up metric, you're prone to the opposite problem by you're trying and pushing a lot of applications down here on the slowdown scale, while you might push a few applications down here on the speed up scale. So optimizing for one metric might hurt the other metric. And what, uh, in, in some sense, what uh, previous work has showed is, if you guys have taken a stats class, which some of you might have, that's the problem with uh, uh, an average, right? So the weighted speed up is really very close to an average in that you just take the sum. You don't divide by the number of cores. So when you take a metric like that, it's prone to uh, being uh, re really reliant on the large numbers, right? On the other hand, the harmonic speed up metric is a little more balanced in that it tries to weight all the smaller and larger numbers more equally by doing this kind of uh, 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 an evaluation. So, so I'm not saying either the metrics is better, but then uh, when someone throws a metric at you, just be aware in the future that uh, uh, like the, IPC, the fallacies that exist with an IPC-like metric, there also exist other issues and fallacies with the multi-core metrics. And just be cognizant and aware of that when you're, let's say, reading a paper, or in, in, let's say you're looking at a metric uh, out there. So in terms of fairness, there are also a bunch of metrics. I'm not going into all of them. The one commonly used metric is the maximum slowdown experienced by any application in a workload. Okay, so that's a common fairness metric. So any questions on metrics? Any thoughts? So it makes sense. OK, cool. Let me move on. So we, uh, I'll, I guess I'll skip this slide in the interest of time and just show, throw some performance results at you. At you. So this is the blacklisting memory schedule. And these are a bunch of previous schedulers. Uh, this shows weighted speed up or system performance, one of the system performance metrics, rather. And this plot shows the maximum slowdown experienced by any application in the workload. So I, I will not dwell too much on the details. So first here, as you see, blacklisting does well. It improves performance compared to everybody else. But then in terms of fairness, it's not as good. Okay. And uh, these are the numbers, but let's forget the numbers for now. But overall, what happens is uh, some of these schedulers, parallelism aware batch scheduling, have you guys heard of that, seen that in the past? You have? OK. So, so uh, what parallelism aware batch scheduling does here is it tries and batches requests such that oldest requests are batched first and they are scheduled first, right? So that's what Power BI or so parallelism aware batch scheduling does. So that kind of a batching mechanism helps provide good fairness. It, it's more fair to applications because you're letting older requests go through before you're, before you're scheduling newer requests. But then in terms of performance, it's a bad thing. So clearly, there's always this trade-off between performance and fairness, right? So when you try and achieve one thing, you sort of give up on the other. So the question is, to what extent do you give up, want to give up on the other? And uh, in some sense, we see that uh, 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 blacklisting achieves the fairness of these previous schedulers uh, that are fairer. I'll not go into too many details of this scheduler here, while achieving better performance than the thread cluster memory scheduling scheduler here. So in terms of complexity, clearly it's a win, because even when I was describing the design, it probably hit a few of you that it's a much simpler scheduler, right? There's not much ranking involved. There's not much prioritization involved. And overall, in terms of hardware complexity, all that clearly helps. So the goal was to see, let's try and do all this uh, simplification of the scheduling. But let's see if it provides us any performance benefits. So apparently, it does. OK. So that sort of uh, uh, concludes the first part of my uh, talk. So any questions here before I go on to predictable performance? Are you going to say something? OK. okay. So I guess we, Rachita mentioned early on that predictable performance, quality of service. He talked about a couple of different things. right? So now let's try and understand what is this predictable performance, and why do we really need predictable performance? So if you remember, right at the beginning of the talk, I, I pulled up a bunch of applications and said, these two applications are run together, and these two are run together. And this application, Leslie 3D slowdown, really depended on whom it was running with. right? So by unpredictability, that's what I mean. When an application slowdown depends heavily on whom it's running with, clearly it's unpredictable. right? Its performance is not very predictable, and uh, that causes issues. But what kind of issues? 
uh, it happens that in today's systems, uh, often multiple applications share resources. Right? And when some of these applications require some kind of guarantees on performance, and I'll talk about that in a second, it becomes important to provide predictability. Now, one example is in server systems, right? Let's, let's take your commodity cloud, for instance, or uh, let's take EC2, right? Uh, you run a bunch, you submit a bunch of jobs to, let's say, a cluster or a cloud. And each job could be from different users. So you can now submit your job to these commodity clusters. But then the problem is uh, you really are going to be put on another machine along with other applications, and you're going to be run along with them. Now, what's the problem with that? OK, let me make it a little more interesting and say, you are built by how long you run. Do you see a problem there? So that you could run the same job at different times based on who else is running, mm -hmm. but you can build different amounts. Exactly. So my, so my job would, could perhaps take like a couple of hours when I'm, when it's, or, or OK, that's too much. Let's say, let's say 10 minutes when it's run on my machine, right, at home. Or when I run, run to the same machine in the cluster by itself, it takes, let's say, 10 minutes. But now, when it's run with other, other applications from different users, its runtime could go all the way to, let's say, 60 minutes. right? So I'm going to be paying for an hour, when in reality, my application just took 10 minutes when run by itself. And it's not really my fault that I'm running for an hour. It's the fault of the other applications running along. And in some sense, that's not a very smart way to build, right? But a lot of, but surprisingly, uh, schemes like that are actually used in today's systems, right? To potentially build customers. So that's one one issue with this unpredictability, right? So clearly, the length of time I run is not predictable, and that's what causing this issue with billing. For in, that's one example. Another could be in your mobile system, right? Let's say you have you have, uh, or it could be in any system. Let's say you have your GPU and CPU running together and they share resources. So Rachita has done work on this front. But basically, they share some resources of some kind. And your GPU really needs to render uh, at a certain frame rate. right? If it doesn't render at that frame rate, you're going to start seeing glitches. And you're going to start, you know, your, your video quality clearly goes down. But uh, if, you, if there is no predictability when the GPU and the CPU are run together, and let's say you run it on a naive memory system that has no notion of predictability and that has no notion of uh, who is running, who is taking up as much resource, uh, who is taking up uh, how much resource, right? So when you don't really have a notion of that, the GPU could slow down significantly. And you might end up start, you might end up seeing like visual glitches. Your frame rate might reduce a lot, right? So that's the problem with, uh, that, with unmanaged, uh, with, unma with, with uncontrolled resource, ma resource management where these different applications run together, share resources, you don't do anything to manage the resource sharing and it could cause heavy unpredictability in a lot of contexts. And it's a, it's a big problem in today's systems. I mean, you, you hear it referred by like a bunch of names. Quality of service is a common terminology that people use for it. And uh, if, I mean, we could go on giving more examples. Another example is, let's say, you have your search queries, right? You type something into your uh, search engine, like Google or Bing or whatever, and uh, you wait for it to come back. So it's really an interactive thing. You're waiting for it to come back, and it takes a certain amount of time to come back, right? Now, uh, let's say it's run alongside other batch processing jobs that are probably doing some, let's say, garbage collection or cleaning, right? So what could happen uh, in Google service? So what could happen is it takes a long time for that interactive job to come back, and you're going to start seeing uh, the, the amount of time it takes for it to come back, right? Because it's an interactive situation. So again, in situations like that, you want to be cognizant of the fact that some jobs are more important than others at different points in time. And some jobs have more requirements on how long they should run. Right? For instance, with search queries and stuff, uh, they try and put a latency cap on how long it takes end to end for a job to go all the way through the network onto the server, execute there, come back through the network, and back. Right? So they try and put latency caps on this entire round trip execution. So that's one way they try and ensure you're not annoyed as a user sitting down and typing in your search query. So there are multiple examples for the need for predictable performance. And uh, to give you a little more of the big picture, it really is important in a, in a lot of contexts. So uh, we re this is a, an architecture class, and we'll predominantly talk about memory, caches, and so on. But then in the, uh, it's also important from the perspective of the network, let's say. right? Uh, the, the query needs to go over the network and come back. So network quality of service also becomes important. You need to ensure that the, that the query or the packet, set of packets takes only a certain amount of time to go over the network. 
Similarly, let us say you miss in the uh, you need to go to the disk, you need to go all the way to the disk, you miss in the la, uh, last level cache, you miss in the main memory. It takes the time time to go to the disk can also bring back stuff, right. So, th that time also needs to be things like that also need to be quantified. So, really in today's world at every resource there is a need to manage it appropriately and manage it in the right fashion to allocate enough amount of uh, uh, resources to different applications depending on their needs and depending on the requirements that they come with. So, being aware of that is very important and that is what I will talk about. So, as a first step towards this kind of predictability, like I said earlier, it is really a multifaceted problem and it is uh, uh, it is important to take care of this predictability at different resources, could be the network disk, could be the memory caches wherever right. In this piece of work, I will really focus on trying to do it in the main memory alone because that is what my work has focused on and that is what I have been doing so far. So, uh, so the question here is I guess before I go into this slide let me go back here and talk about the notion of predictability itself. So, there are multiple notions of predictability that could potentially be there right. So, uh, let us try and get some examples from you guys. So, tell me one way in which uh, you would define predictability right. Let us say what, what could it be? Hmm, sure. The, or, or let me extend that little bit further and say it takes a certain amount of time or it takes it is within a bound, it takes within a certain amount of time the certain range and you cannot exceed that or. Like if you have two programs running like each one will take twice as long as every hmm? each one will take three times as long. Hmm? Yeah, sure compared to like let us say when it was minute run alone right, let us say it takes like twice as long, sure that is a good example. <coughs> So, I guess let, um, so one st another uh, other more uh, less obvious ways are these are not really defined at the application of the program level itself, but let us say try and ensure that the application gets at least half of the memory on the system or half of the memory bandwidth on the system or it gets half the cache space on the system. So, these are other notions of predictability that people also use because part of the reason is uh, th uh, the notions that you guys talked about are harder right because it is at the application level ensuring that the application only takes a certain amount of time or only slows down or its execution time only increases by 2 x 3 x is a much harder thing to do. And so, one thing that people have looked also looked at is to try and provide some kind of uh, bounds on how much resource an application gets. So, now I guess I will go on further after, uh, uh, and say that uh, the notion of uh, predict we really pick just one notion of predictability and run with that here for this piece of work right. So, the notion we pick is slow down or it is re really what you said in terms of when an application is run by itself and it is and when it is run with others it should not take more than like 2 x or 3 x that is the notion of predictability. So, really uh, I, I guess uh, the next uh, speaker is also here. So, I will try and uh, wind up in the next uh, 5 to 7 minutes and I guess he can take over after that, but I will give you the high level ideas of how we true and try and do this right. So, now uh, if we have to provide predictability as our notion of predictability is slow down right. The first step is really to try and estimate how much an application slows down when it is run along with others and then the second thing once we have these estimates is to try and control or put a cap on how much an application can slow down by that is the 2 x 3 x kind of notion that you talked you talked about, but before we do that we need to find out how much is the actual slowdown itself currently and whether it is already within the bound or whether it is already exceeding the bound. So, we have I will really talk about our uh, major observations that enable us to estimate slowdowns. So, slowdown of an application more generally not the IPC definition is performance of an application when run alone by performance shared, performance could mean different things execution time IPC whatever right. Now, performance shared of an application can be measured fairly easily because it is really the performance of an application when it is run along with others right, how much time it takes when it is run along with others. But then trying to find out how much time it would have taken had it run by itself on a system is harder without really just running it alone right. And it becomes a challenge especially in scenarios let us say you submit your job to a cluster and I am going back to that example. But in that case they really get so many jobs from so many different users and they do not have a way of running each of them separately and profiling them to get their performance alone. So, clearly we need another way of figuring out performance alone without running each job by itself alone and that is where our uh, observation comes in. We see that for a memory bound application 
its performance is roughly proportional to the rate at which its memory requests are served. So, what I really mean is if you have a deterministic sequence of, of, uh, of uh, uh, request to memory right on a system, the sequence is deterministic. So, this sequence really corresponds to x amount of progress right. If you, if you for instance, if you serve y request that corresponds to x amount of progress and we are really trying to see can we use this number of requests served as a metric for progress instead of looking at how much time or other things and I will tell you why that makes sense. So, uh, we run this experiment on a real system. So, the x axis shows the request service rate of the application memory request service rate or in other words uh, uh, it is normalized here to when the application is run alone. So, this point means uh, when the application is run alone this is where its request service rate was it is normalized and this is how it reduces when the application is run along with others and the y axis shows the performance normalized again. So, clearly what you see here is uh, y equals x like trend right. So, there is in fact a very strong correlation between request service rate and performance at least for applications that are heavily bound at the memory and we see this with other applications also and uh, what this leads us to say is that now if we go back and revisit the slowdown expression. Now, what can I do here in this expression? How do I use that? I am saying perform request service rate is a proxy for performance. Yeah, exactly. So, I can represent performance alone by performance shared, the request service rate alone by request service, service rate shared if that applic if that observation that I described earlier holds right. So, that is really the first observation we have here. Now, this is easy to measure right because it is again a measurable quantity, but we have the same problem with request service rate alone right. How do you actually measure it without really running an application alone. Now, that is where our second observation comes in. We observe that for an application if we give it highest priority at the memory controller then we can estimate its request service rate alone fairly fairly reasonably because when an application is given highest priority uh, the other applications cause minimal interference to this application right. Now, let us just look at this one with an example. So, here is an application when it is run alone by itself two requests queued up and these two requests are just served back to back right because there is nothing else from any other application and they just served. Now, let us consider the case when it is run with other another application uh, that application has like one request in between let us call it the blue application. So, now if I just serve requests in the order in which they came in this is what would happen right. It would take three time units for these two requests of the red application to be served. Now, let us consider a third case where the red application is given highest priority. So, when it has highest priority these two requests are picked up like row buffer hits were prioritized right. Similarly, these two requests were picked up are picked up and they just schedule first. So, it takes only two time units for these requests to be served. Now, but there is a catch here and let me ask you guys what that is right. So, will this really work in all situations? Can you think of a situation where it does not make sense to use uh, highest priority as a way to find out request service rate alone? Exactly, exactly. So, that is the scenario where let us say this one did not come in right. Uh, it was this first that is done and now this comes in. Now, uh, the DRAM memory scheduler typically uh, serves requests in the uh, if, if there is no request from the highest priority you try and serve any other request that is outstanding right because you do not want to waste memory bandwidth. So, when you do that you schedule this application this applications request and while it is ongoing uh, this application the red applications request comes in and you do not really want to stop processing blue applications request because DRAM the DRAM memory system has some overheads right. So, when you want to stop a request it is not like you just stop it and resume with another request. There are issues in terms of if you if you remember some of the previous lectures you need to pre charge activate and do a bunch of things to access a row in DRAM right. So, you have to go through all that cycle when you stop this request in between and switch to another request and that is all like a waste of DRAM bandwidth and DRAM time. So, you do not really do that. So, I guess the uh, model for memory bound applications uh, based on these two observations is really this. In the interest of time I guess I will skip the model for non memory bound applications. Now, uh, I will just give you the high level idea I would not go over these slides. So, we see that this works well when an application spends a large amount of its time waiting at memory. 
But there are scenarios when an application could not be spending that much amount of time waiting for memory, right? Meaning it's more compute bound. Let's say it sends out only one request once in a while. And then request service rate is not really a reasonable metric to use for slowdown. So we, we have another observation and we figure out a way to uh, find out uh, the slowdown of a non-memory bound application. Let me just give you the final result and it will sort of make sense. So this alpha is the fraction of time an application spends waiting for memory, let's say, right? Then this 1 minus alpha is the time it spends doing compute, for instance. Then the, uh, what are we really saying is the compute fraction remains unchanged with memory interference. But the memory fraction alone, which is alpha, changes with interference. I know that was fairly fast. Sorry about that. Um, I just, I'm just trying to wrap this up. So once we estimate application slowdowns, I guess uh, we really try and estimate these quantities during each interval and estimate slowdown at the end of an interval and keep repeating that, right? So now that's a way to estimate application slowdowns. Now, uh, I guess the, uh, we have a, I mean, we evaluate the model. I will skip the details of the evaluation and just show you the final results. So this is one example of an application. These are the actual slowdowns, the blue line. These are slowdown estimates from a previous mechanism, which I, I understand you guys have seen briefly at some point, but I'll not go into the details there. Stall time fair, memory scheduling. And these are slowdowns from estimates from mice, and they're fairly accurate, and they're much closer to the actual slowdowns. And this is true with a bunch of other applications. Actual slowdowns, estimates from STFM, estimates from mice, and they're much closer. So overall, our error is much lower compared to what previous work did. I wish I'd, be, I'd been able to contrast them qualitatively, but I guess uh, I don't have the time for that. Now, I'll briefly talk about what you could do once you have slowdown estimates, right? So once you actually have estimates on slowdowns, you can use them to control them, right? A very simple mechanism that you could do is to uh, just periodically look at slowdowns and allocate enough bandwidth to applications that, ma that, that care, right? Some applications care about meeting a certain bound. Let's say I have five applications on my system, and just one of them cares about meeting a slowdown bound, right? Let's say two x, the rest of them don't. Or they don't pay enough, for instance, on a cluster, right? Let's say you can have multiple modes of operation. One is a priority mode, where if someone pays you more, then you need to ensure that they're not slowed down beyond, let's say, a certain amount. For the other application, they can slow down, right? So you could do this. You could assign the remaining bandwidth to the other applications, and uh, that, that could be it. So I guess I, uh, I will wind up at this point. So uh, I've really talked about main memory interference here and uh, how do we try and provide predictable performance in the presence of main memory interference alone. And uh, I'd like to, one, one, one message I'd like to leave with you guys is that uh, uh, other resources matter as well. On chip, there are shared caches. So it's important to provide predictability in the presence of shared caches as well. Off chip, there are a bunch of other resources. There is network, disk, bunch of things. So trying to be aware of all these resources and some, providing some kind of predictability at all these resources is an important topic of research. And a lot of people are looking at it in different uh, regions and in different directions. So any questions? So I guess not, so. Okay. Thanks for the introduction. Yeah, so today I'm going to talk about something that is probably you didn't touch too much. So far I'll talk about hardware-based compression. I'm going to spend all my time on cache compression. Just so I would prefer to cover more topic, uh, one topic in more detail than just covering too many different topics. And as Rachata said, please, if you have questions or concerns, just interrupt and we can answer them. OK, so the topic of the today's talk is it's there. It's base delta immediate compression. It's a new compression algorithm for hardware. And I'll talk about how it can be incorporated in the existing caches. This is joint work between Carnegie Mellon and Intel Labs here in Pittsburgh. I'll start with the slide that you've probably have seen before in one or another way. So this is something called memory wall, right? So what I'm showing here, you see there, there are, oops, yeah. You see the calendar years, and you see the relative performance of memory versus processor, right? And you see a huge gap there that just keep extending. 
The extension is a little bit slowed down nowadays, but it's still there, right? And the overhead of uh, the latency between processes memory, it's like hundreds and hundreds of cycles. So the quest first question to you, what is the common way we deal with the memory wall that you already learned in this class? Caching. Yes, caching, right? So that's a very common, and you see like, well, it seems like it's not a problem, I can just cache things, right? But the problem is that with caches, uh, they already occupy a huge amount of space. Like look at Intel Core i7, like say Sandy Bridge. That's your just L3 without L2 or L1, right? You see how much space is there. So if you keep increasing number of cores, uh, the cache also needs to increase, and not linearly, unfortunately. So similar is true for like say IBM cores. You see this is L3 cache, those L2 caches there. So it's a lot of area and space, right? So with cache being such an important uh, shared resource, you really want to use it wisely. And you don't want to waste area and power to get more cache, right? But at the same time, when you look at the data you store in, in memory and in cache, you'll see a lot of redundancy there. So this is a small snapshot from main memory. You see tons of zeros there, like a lot of narrow values. That's how we call them. And one way of exploiting this redundancy is essentially having compression in the cache in hardware itself. And the hope is that the compression in the cache will provide you the effect of a larger cache without making it physically larger, right? So this is the goal. And I'll give you a little bit of background on cache compression just for you to understand what is important there and what is a little bit less important. Because some things might be a little bit non-intuitive. So let's say we have a system with CPU, a single core there, L1 cache, they all operate on uncompressed data. That is just conventional CPU and L1. You have a link that goes to L2, and L2, like a last level cache, it can have data in both compressed and uncompressed form. So how the usual uh, memory request works? If it, it's, it's a hit in L1 cache, the latency is really small. It's one, two cycles for the modern L1 caches. If the data goes to all the way to L2 cache, the latency is high, it's roughly say 15 cycles for the modern last level caches. And there can be two scenarios here if the last level is compressed. The first scenario is data is already stored in the uncompressed form. As you can see, then you just can deliver it to CPU and L1. But if the data is compressed, now there is additional unit on your critical path and that's decompression. So the data should go through decompression first, and only that is uncompressed. Because of that, decompression, it might be a surprise for you, but decompression is more important than compression even itself for hardware design, because that's on the critical path. Compression, you can do it in the background when the data arrives from, the, uh, from say, DRAM, or when you write back the data, it all can be hidden, this latency, right? So compression latency is important, but it's less important than the decompression. So this is a pattern takeaway from that slide. And looking at this background, we can formulate three key requirements for any cache compression you want to do with any algorithm. So those requirements are, it should be fast, means that it should have low decompression latency. It should be simple, because all everything I'm talking about needs to be implemented in hardware, right? And it should be effective. So whatever we pay here should be justified with an extension of the size, right? So if my compression ratio is something like 1.5, then I create illusion for the system that instead of two megabyte, I have like three megabyte cache, right? Without almost no hardware changes. That's the hope. Okay, so we just finished with motivation background. Then I'll talk about what, pro, uh, what before me people try to do with cache compression. And they were partially successful, of course, but certain things were not solved. So one question I will ask to you, because even going into that, why not software compression? I'm pretty sure all of you some, use some compression algorithm before, right? So you either use gzip or zip2 somewhere, right? So you know, you, you use compression on disk. Why we can't just take that algorithm, implement it in hardware, and use it, right? Like too complicated? It's too complicated, but can you expand on that? Like uh, it's... Like I'm not totally sure how they work, but I just know they're more. Mm -hmm. Have you heard about lamp of compression? 
like about any dictionary-based compression. Think about most of the compression algorithms, the way they work, I'll talk about them. It's like a dictionary. They linearly go through your data and they try to figure out a sequence of bits that are repeated. And then encode the sequence of bits with smaller bits that just reference to a dictionary. So those how all, most of the algorithms we ever use, that's how they work. Like it's just a dictionary-based compression. Multimedia has their own versions, but that's essentially, that's the redundancy of data that we're trying to exploit, and that's what you do, right? The problem is that if you think of algorithm like that, it's fundamentally sequential. You linearly go through the data. So the latency is not going to be parallelizable, it's going to be huge. So yes, the complexity is a problem, and as I said, decompression latency, People try to take and do whatever you do in GZIP and hardware. It was hundreds of cycles for decompressions, thousands for compression. So complexity is the problem, right? So there are, there are mechanisms for lossless data compression, like LAMPLZ if it's using GZIP and PNG formats. And there's LZW that's using GIF, right? And there's also something that you might heard about called Huffman encoding. It's all way too complex. That's the problem. Otherwise, we would just take it and have it in hardware. So the reason why it's used on disk and the disk and latencies are uncomparable. Like 1,000 cycles is nothing for disk, right? It's like six orders of magnitude difference with core, right? So that's why it's acceptable in disk, but not acceptable in main memory, or even, and of course, in the caches. There are also some lossy data compression that you all use when you are playing audio and video, right? So you're all familiar with that, more or less. So the problem is that it's very effective. Compression ratios are great but they are slow and complex, right? So that's the main concern. So now I talk about what people try to do in hardware. So in hardware, people realized very soon we can't use software algorithms. We need to come up something simpler. It's going to be because it's simply have lower uh, compression ratios, but it's still, if it delivers something good for us, we can use it. But it needs to be, have this nice trade-off. So there will be several mechanisms, and the first one I'll talk about is going to be very trivial, zero compression, right? So how does it work? Idea is that if I have like huge sparse matrices, a lot of initialization ways, a lot of zeros, what I do, I, I see that my whole cache line is full of zeros, and then I use a single bit in tag to represent that information. Then I don't need to store anything in the data storage at all, right? Because I know my whole cache line is zero, right? So it's great, as you can imagine, for cache lines that are zeros, right? It's very fast, everything is great. But there are some disadvantages, and like, not all data have a lot of zeros, right, unfortunately. So it means that if we look at the characteristics that are important, remember I mentioned three characteristics. Decompression latency is going to be great. It's going to be almost like zero cycles. Complexity, is almost no complexity there. But compression ratio is way too low, right? Okay, that's way too simple, essentially, right? We need to go something uh, different. The next algorithm that was invented at the beginning of 2000 is called frequent value compression. And I'll show you how it works. So the idea is to encode cache lines based on some frequently observed value. So you say you're running your game and you're having some background. There are a lot of similar color pixels. This is a frequent value that you permanently store. You don't need to store like four byte or like eight byte for that pixel. Instead, what you can do, you just encode it efficiently. Let's say we have a cache line like this, right? It's just like a piece of a cache line. And imagine I want to do a frequent value encoding. And again, imagine I run some algorithm that figure out what are the frequent values that I have, right? And it tells me zero is a frequent value. And it's in fact one of the most frequent value you will see in memory. Another frequent value is one. Another value is like, say, FF, right? And encoding 1, 1 is used for non-frequent values. Then how the algorithm works, it just takes every single word here and encodes it with this simple code, right? So you see this 0 is going to be encoded like 0, 0. It's just two bits. And FF is just 1, 0, based on this table, right? And non-frequent values, as you can see, you need to store both the code and the value itself. So Let's say data is compressed with frequent value, and it gets smaller this way, right? So who can tell me what's the issue potentially with this thing? Yes, like things are compressed, right? But, yep? If you don't profile correctly, it needs to be on 
Yeah, exactly. So the profiling is a very big concern. So first you need to do it somehow dynamically on the flight. Now imagine I was running my game and now I'm running web browser, like frequent values change. What I'm gonna do, like throw away my whole cache, the whole content, or if like how I'm gonna do this profiling dynamically, that's a problem. And as soon as you do it, all the encodings are incorrect anymore. Like you need to deal with coherence, all these issues are now arise, right? So that's the first order concern, and you're exactly right. There is another concern. Anyone? Like, remember the key thing, like think about this algorithm, like think about what is important. Like, I remember I mentioned decompression. How would you decompress this thing? Is it gonna be easy, complex? Like, what's the problem with decompressing things like that? Any ideas? Remember something similar with dictionary base, yep? Well, if you want to get the value of like the ABCD block, then you have to go through each term. Basically. Exactly, that's exactly right. So it's, it's the whole algorithm, again, very sequential, right? You need to go through the whole thing before you actually know the word you want to read, right? It requires a lot of work. It's very hard to parallelize it, right? You can bin it somehow, but again, it's, it's tough, right? So everything is dependent. The location of this guy dependent on all previous lines there, right? So it's the same issue as is dictionary based. So the best algorithm uh, for decompression like that was eight cycles, which might doesn't sound that bad, but if you think about heat latency of say 15 cycles, every access is now like 50% longer, right? So it, it, it's, it's a lot. You will see that it has a significant impact on the cache performance. Every cycle matters for the cache. So frequent value has a good compression ratio. I'll show you the results later. But complexity is an issue, and complexity is for the, the gentleman provide an argument because of the profiling, that, that's an issue. And decompression latency, as you said, is another issue. So there was improvement over that called frequent pattern compression. So how does that work? So frequent pattern says, well, it seems like profiling is a bad idea. So let me look for some encodings that happens for all applications, something that's common across multiple applications, such that I don't need to run profiling. So what they said, they say, let's look at the sum occurring patterns. So for instance, you have a value, and the first bits, the first half words, is zero or one, like sign extension, right? Redundant bits. So let's encode those things efficiently. So let's say we have, an, again, cache line like that. What are the frequent patterns that were described in that work? So first, for all zeros, you have a code. You have code for, say, first half zeros, right? Or second half zeros, or repeated bytes, or say, all ones. So for all that, you have some codes. And there is, again, code for not a frequent pattern. So let's look how it works for that cache line. And again, any questions so far? I didn't, if I'm too fast, let me know. And for instance, value like that, you see it's padded with zeros, right? How you can encode it, you can say, well, this is the special code for first half zeros, and whatever is non-zeros, you stored it in full, right? Then for zeros, you don't need to store anything here. You just store a code, three bits code. For something like FFF, you store, you say like, oh, it's a repeated byte here, right? You can store something like that. And for something like it's ABCDEFF, you just need to store it in full, right? So the benefit, you can, you can just guess, right? Profiling is not needed. This is all static patterns, right? So it's a static compression. But what are the issues? So let's say the data is compressed with something like that. So that's the result after compression. So what's the problem? Same, Same thing, right? What, what exactly it is? The fields are all different. Inside. Yeah, fields are all different, yes. So again, decompression, they, the authors tried to optimize of that paper in 2004. They try to optimize the design a lot, but still five cycles. That's the best they can get for one gigahertz frequency. So it's still too much. Because of that, in the practical design, they need to do a lot of hacks, how to not enable compression all the time, because if it's not useful, then you have a lot of a huge penalty. So you see the, as we just discussed, compression ratio, I'll show it's gonna be good. Complexity is reasonable, so we avoid the problem of profiling, but decompression latency is still there. So whatever I'll try to propose, called base delta immediate compression, I'll try to convince you that all three problems can be reasonably solved. It's a little bit of a marketing slide, but again, it's how we sell our research as well. 
Okay, so what is the key idea about base delta immediate? So my first step was I look at real applications and I want to understand what are the key data patterns exist in these applications. And what I've seen, there are a lot of zeros because of initialization sparse matrices, null pointers. A lot of repeated values when they are just the same value repeated again and again. There are a lot of narrow values, small values you store it in big data types. And it's not like programmers are doing a crappy job of representing their data. Let's say you have a counter, right? And you don't know how big it is gonna be. So you just dedicated an integer four byte or eight byte type. But then counters happens to be small in many cases, you just need one byte. So for you to keep track of that, it's a nightmare, right? Some of your counters can be huge, some can be small. So you don't want to take care of that. You just use the biggest type. But because of that, it becomes suboptimal. And in other cases, pointers, especially in 64-bit systems, your pointers are huge. But really, the bits that are different, when you debug things, you might notice that only few ending bits are actually changing, right? The rest is just a point to some big memory region. So all that patterns that happens in the modern applications. And I actually look at the variety of applications. There are some spec benchmarks, you databases, web workloads. And I look how frequent are those data patterns. So what I did, I make a snapshot of the cache with all the values, and I count it how many frequent patterns you have. And this is the average over execution of the whole application. As you can see, depending on the application, the number of different patterns can be quite significant. And the average is 43%. So even those simple patterns that I just described on the previous slides are already quite frequent, right? So it means that if I can represent them somehow, I can actually get a very reasonable compression ratio with something simple. But the question is like, they're also different. Like, what can anyone guess what is what makes them similar? How I can what is similar about all these patterns, right? Is there anything comes come to mind? Like, they all have redundancy, but this redundancy is kind of different, but the same is kind of the same. What? Yeah, in this particular case, it's last byte. It's not necessarily just the last byte, but to make it a little more scientific, the term for that is the low dynamic range. So if you look through the values, the range of values is small. So the value itself can be huge as a pointer, but the range is small, right? So that allows us to represent this value more efficiently. And the way we represent it is called base delta encoding. So essentially what we do, if I have a cache line, and I say cache line consists of different pointers, what I do, I pick one value as the base, and everything else is represented as a delta offset from that base. So for instance, this is gonna be just zero, this is gonna be like eight, and so on. The key takeaway here that instead of say 32 byte compressed cache line, what I need, I just need 12 bytes, right, to represent this data. With such a simple technique. And the main, like, that's the base delta encoding, and the main technique that can be used to do that is, uh, so first of all, we save in space, of course. But if you think about it, decompression now finally can be fast. Why? To decompress this thing, I can use a simple CMD like of vector addition in a single cycle, summing up this base with all these values. It's massively parallel. I can just decompress it. So finally, decompression can be as fast as a single instruction, single cycle. And you can just decompress the whole thing fully. So how about complexity? Well, to compress or decompress things like that, I need simple arithmetic comparisons and subtractions. That's it. So no complex logic like in lamp or ZIF, all right? No profiling. And I'll show again, comp compression ratio numbers will come later. But even right now, you can guess this 43% are gonna be covered, right, at least. Or maybe even more. So this is the first step, base delta encoding. Any questions? Is it clear why this is gonna be better? Not maybe for compression ratio, but at least for decompression. Question? Can you have a negative offset or a negative delta? Yes, you can have a negative delta. Again, in the interest of time, I don't talk about this, but essentially, um, for every time you compute deltas, you also need to have a sign whether it's negative or positive, and it's stored in the tag. I'll talk about this a little bit later. But it's a very good question. Yes, it can be negative, but it's easy to deal with that. Just one bit per delta, isn't it? it? No? Okay. So that's the key idea. So my question was, okay, so this 43% is going to be covered with a technique like that. Can I do better? 
and I look at cases where they were not compressible with base delta encoding. This is another application. So you can see I have a cache line. And the problem would be, what if I have a say in C or C++, I have a data struct consi consists of two different fields, right? One say pointer and another is a counter. So they all separately have low dynamic range. But when I merge them together, what is going to be this bias that I can use to compress them all together? There is no, right? It's, I need more bases essentially, right? So the problem like here, you need to use more bases. For instance, in this case, I need one base for these red values and another base for these green values, right? So benefit of using more bases, I can compress more data. But there is downside as well. It's not clear how in hardware would efficiently find those bases. And another problem is that it's potentially high overhead. So for something that I could be potentially compressed with one basis, I need to store more metadata bases, right? I want to avoid that, ideally. So we did a study again. We want to understand what is this trade-off. So what I did, I just tried different number of bases. And the trade-off is like that. The more bases I have, the more cache lines become compressible. But at the same time, the overhead of having more bases makes my compression ratio lower. Okay, so and the optimum happens to be around two bases on average across. There are some applications that benefit from three, four, but on average two bases was practical optimum, right? Because other, after that, overhead of all these many bases is cut in your compression ratio. Is it clear? Okay, so but still, I want to do this very optimally in hardware. How would, can I do, can I get benefit of two bases without having two bases? Because somehow I need to find those two bases. I don't want to sort values, it's all expensive, right? So what we found is can be some simple heuristics that can be used to deal with that. So first, for first base, I found if the data is compressible, any value of the first value is good, any value essentially is good enough to be the base. Because as you said, there can be negative offset, so if the values are close, any of them can be good enough to be the base. So I do, don't need to find mean and max and figure out the medi uh, median between them. I really can just take almost any element. It, it's almost as good as having an optimal. So this is base delta part of our compression algorithm. And for a second base, I figure out that there are a lot of narrow values for different reasons because there are a lot of <coughs> values that are small, there are alignment rules in C, C++ that add some padding. So we can use implicit base of zero. The good part, we call it immediate part. The reason why implicit base of zero is good because you don't need to store it. You just tell it's offset from zero. So it's a second base for free, right? So that's a bad. So you, I can take example that we had before and have one base for red and another base for green. It will be perfectly fine. So advantage over two arbitrary bases is better compression ratio and simpler compression logic. And this is base delta immediate compression, the one that we actually implemented in hardware even. So one experiments we did, we check how BDI performs versus base delta with just two bases. So it's like base delta with two bases, it can have any ar two arbitrary bases. BDI have one base arbitrary, the second one implicit. So it means that the, uh, the overhead of compression is lower for the ones that are compressible, but this guy can potentially compress more cache lines with two random bases, okay? And you see that they're roughly on par on average. That's why we decided to go with BDI, essentially. It, it seems like this one doesn't give us a lot, but there are more overhead of it. So we've, we're done with uh, the key idea and the design. So now I'll talk a little bit about how the hell I'm going to exploit this in the cache. Because if I only talk about compression, I never told you how I'm going to get a benefit of that capacity in a real cache. And very soon you realize there are quite a few challenges there. So there will be three pieces. There are going to be decompressor design, compressor design, and BDI cache organization. So first of all, how would I build decompressor? So this is just with one base. So the reason why it's so fast, if you have a data compressed with BDI, you just copy b uh, base everywhere, and then it's a simple adder. Simple vector addition, the whole cache line is decompressed. So it can be as fast as a single processor cycle. That's why the first challenge is solved. Now, how about compression? So what's the challenge with compression? Like, anyone have, like, let's say I give you a cache line. Uh, 
how would you compress it with BDI? Like, how would you compress it with base delta encoding? What are the issues there? Think about it. You have a 64 byte of raw data. So what are you going to do with it? Like, think about it. Like, you have the data. You don't know anything about it. It's just data, raw data. What's the first problem? You need to see which base it's closer to. Like base this is partially true, but even before that, I don't even know the granularity of my values. Is it two byte, four byte values, eight bytes? Who knows, right? In hardware, I have no idea what kind of values are stored there. So because of that, I need to try different combinations of sizes of base and delta. So because my low dynamic range can be different, can be very extreme such that uh, one byte is enough for delta. It can be two bytes is enough for the delta, or four bytes. So I need to try all different combination of compression schemes, right? And separately for zero and repeated values. So how it works, I tried all these combinations in parallel. And the reason I have to do it because I have zero knowledge of what exactly the data is there. I'm trying to guess. And the reason I pick 8, 4, 2, and 1 is because those are sizes of the conventional data types we have in programming languages, right? Those are the types that are going to be there, OK? And then every compression unit like that returns us two pieces of information. It tells us the compression flag, essentially tells whether this cache line is compressible with this particular compression unit. And it also tells you the compression cache line after the compression. One good thing about BDI-like compression is that the size is always fixed. It's predictable, right? You know the size of your base. You know the size of your delta. You know how many deltas you have. So your size, it can be a simple mapping table. So it's not totable variable. Every unit here has a fixed size. So after that, I can pick the one that has the best size, right? For instance, if I have zeros, that's my best unit. If I have something like four bytes, delta, uh, four byte base, one byte delta, or eight byte base, one byte delta, this is going to be better, and so on. So all of them have fixed size that you can just compute on a piece of paper, right? So it's all predictable. So that's uh, how it works at high level. A single unit, though, will work like that. I would assume that the values in the cache line, let's say eight byte, this is for eight byte base, one byte delta, and then I compute the delta from the first base, I'll get all those deltas. And then I check for every delta, whether it fits into one byte range, because it's one byte delta unit, right? And if all of them fits, then yes, it is compressible, and that's the result after compression. If it's not, then I said not, and hopefully it would be compressible with some other compression unit. Maybe not. Question? What if only, can you have just some of them be compressible? Very good question. In this design, no. I had some other designs when you can have some of them compressible. But the thing is, as soon as you do that, you face the same issue you had before. Things become variable size within a cache line, so you need to deal with that somehow. So your decompression latency will go up at least three cycles. OK, any other questions? So now probably the, uh, the hardest things that I didn't talk so far is how the cache is going to be organized when the data is compressed. Remember right now, when you have a conventional cache, let's say two-way cache, 32-byte cache line, just for simplicity, it has tags, right? It has data storage, right? And the data has a direct mapping through tag, right? Every tag maps to a piece of data. After compression, the data becomes variable in size. So I want, in a single set, store more data. I unavoidably need more pointers to the data, right? Because if I want to have more cache lines compressedly stored, I need some pointers to the data to figure them out. So because of that, the corresponding BDI design need to have high associativity. So I need to increase the number of tag storage, uh, the tag units. The difference here is that I'm not double the cache size. I'm only double the number of pointers. And pointers are, say, like 8% of your cache, right? And the hope is that I can actually double the capacity of the cache or be closer to that. But this is the cost. I need more pointers to the data to represent this data. So twice as many tags is one potential option. Then every single text needs additional bits. It needs to store bits that tells you whether this cache line compressed with one particular flavor of BTI. Is it zeros? Is it repeated values? Is it something like base 8, delta 1, and so on? 
So that's the bits that you need to store here. And then the data itself, a single set, needs to be segmented into smaller pieces. Because if I want to explain, if everything is 64 or 32 bytes, I can't do much with it. So I need to cut it into smaller pieces. And now every single tag maps to a sequence of adjacent smaller segments. So uncompressed cache line would consist of four segments. But now compression ones can be like one segment, two segments, three, four in that example, right? This way I can actually get benefit of compression in a regular cache design without major changes to the cache. Questions? Because that's a, probably the hardest part of there. Yep? Is fragmentation a problem? Yes, fragmentation is a problem. That's a very good question. So um, the hope is that, first of all, there are two ways of dealing with fragmentation. One is doing periodic reshuffling of the data. If there are like empty segments not used, you can shift things around. And there are designs that help that. There were several proposals solving that problem. Again, in this design, we don't try to solve that problem in any reasonable way. We're just trying to be smart with, during the replacement. We try to replace the blocks of the same size in terms of segments with the same size. But yeah, the good observation we had is that usually the data st stays around the same size for a long period of time, in terms of segments at least. So it doesn't jump a lot when you execute the application. It happens sometimes, but it's... So usually you replace three, uh, three segments with three segments. Okay. Not always, but that's a common case. But yes, it's a problem. With everything, every time you deal with compression, fragmentation is potentially an issue. Other questions? It was a good question. OK. So the overhead is 2.3% for a 2 megabyte cache. So with the benefits I'll show soon, you will, it's going to be clear that it's a justifiable overhead. So we'll go for the results right now. I'm not going to talk too much about my methodology. Again, hardware was not available. I need to simulate the results. So it's going to simulation. Although a logic for compression, decompression, we implement in Verilog, synthesize the logic. So we actually know the latency and energy. So what are the key metrics? I guess you're familiar, you should be familiar with them so far. So IPC, instruction per cycles. Uh, for performance. MPKI misses peculiar instructions to figure out how well the cache behaves. Uh, compression ratio and weighted speeds up for multi-core cases. Yeah, can, tell, can someone tell me why do we use weighted speed up for multi-core and not the IPC? Do you guys know? Do you know what weighted speed up is? Did you see this before? In case. Oh, okay, Valanya went over that, but it's, I mean, it was today. So yeah, OK, we're not going to go too deeply into that. Essentially, IPC for single core is a good metric. For a multi-core, it's not a representative metric anymore. You need a relative performance of application. Otherwise, what happens, you can speed up one thing really dramatically, and the, another one will slow down, say, twice. But as the sum of IPCs, it will look like a great improvement. So you speed up one thing twice, slow down another thing half, and it will look like for you, you do things in, something good. So you really need to normalize things perfectly, OK? So first, compression. So what are their competitors here? This is zero compression, frequent value, frequent pattern, BDI. As you can see, compression ratio depends on application. Sometimes one technique is better, sometimes other. But the key takeaway that BDI, that is simpler than FPC and FVC, provides compression ratio either better or competitive with them. But all three provides reasonable compression ratio. Remember, this is not a raw compression. This is effective cache size increase. So I might have even better compression ratio, but I might not have enough pointers, enough tags. Imagine a set consists of all zeros. Its compression ratio is like 64x, but I only have twice more tags. So my compression ratio in those designs cannot go beyond two, right? But again, with all that, it's justifiable, reasonable, something that Intel can build nowadays. So clearly, because the cache becomes bigger, uh, performance IPC will go up. So here I show the red, a conventional cache of different sizes without compression. This is co blue bars, are corresponding performance numbers for compressed version. Okay? And this is the delta in performance, relative delta. As you can see, in many cases, our performance is almost the performance of a twice larger cache. So for an overhead of several percent due to tag overhead, we get a benefit of only twice the cash in terms of performance. 
And the reason why that happens is because the number of misses decreases for all these designs. So we make a cache more effective, essentially, for all these workloads. The number for every bar here average across 32 applications that we have. Any questions? So you see, we provide good compression ratio. Because of that, we decrease in PKI. It has a positive effect on single core performance. We also have good results on multi-core, but in the interest of time, I'll skip that. And uh, so I'll probably just talk about some interesting future work we can do. So as, as you've seen, I uh, did something right now uh, with the cache, but I didn't really change the cache deeply, right? I just add a little bit more tags. I, need, uh, I did segmentation in the data storage, but I, don't want, I didn't touch it that much, right? But there are a lot of cool things you can do, actually, because after you have compression, things are variable in size. You can have a nice replacement policies that are aware of the block size, say, for instance, compressed block size. So right now, what kind of replacement policies are you aware? So what did you use in caches? What was the replacement policies? LRU. LRU, like least recently used, exactly. So the negative effect of LRU here is that it's totally unaware of the block size. Imagine you have a block with some reasonable good reuse, and it's 64 bytes. And then you have four blocks that are, say, 16 bytes. Right now, if this particular block seems to be the most recently used, I'm not going to touch it. And I might need to beat instead four small blocks. But you can imagine that there will be requests coming for these smaller blocks. They might cumulatively give you four hits instead of one hit. So you need to be smarter now. As soon as you have blocks variable in size, there are a lot of cool things you can do with the replacement policy. L LRU, even Bellady's optimal replacement, is not optimal anymore. If the size is variable, you can do better than optimal. OK. Another uh, work that I, uh, I was doing with several uh, undergrads, that actually students that were taking this class before, uh, we did a very log model for everything we said. So we actually built this cache, we built compression logic. We actually improved that can be built in real hardware potentially if you want to go with that. And we have a collaboration right now with Intel trying to convince them to actually to build things like that. Because they are doing active research on that as well. Because again, for the reasons you, you got at the beginning, right? They want to have larger cache, but they don't want to pay the full price. So they're looking for all possible tricks you can do. And compression is one of them. My next work that I'm not going to talk today is really main memory compression. And uh, you might think about, well, it's straightforward just to use that compression here, but unfortunately, no. And the fundamental difference between main memory compression and cache compression that in, uh, in caches, in last level cache, you store the data and write the data in the cache line granularity. So you take like 64 bytes, you write back 64 bytes. In main memory, you operate on pages, right, in OS. But you still read the data as a cache lines. So you need to store somehow all this metadata crap. You don't want to essentially compress the whole page. Because that, when you read a sub piece, a cache line of that, it's, it's, it's hard to figure out where the offset is. So there are a lot of interesting problems in there. And if you're interested, I would be happy to talk with you about it. But I decided not to put it to the today's lecture. I think you had enough content for today. You had mice, you had blacklisting, and you had my talk as well. So very briefly, conclusion, uh, we propose a new compression algorithm called base delta immediate compression with the key insights that many cache lines in the existing application have low dynamic range that can be exploited with base delta encoding. The key property uh, that you'd want to have for the cache compression, low latency, simple hardware implementation, and high compression ratio are met in the design, and we can improve as a cache hit ratio and performance for many single core and multi core workloads, and we outperform state of the art compression techniques. That's another marketing remark here. But that's it. I think I'm good with time. I have a few more minutes for, for questions from you guys. Thanks for your attention. Yeah. Anything? Was it clear? Was it confusing? That was pretty okay. clear. Okay. So you got a little bit of feeling what kind of research we do in like this other direction. So of course I'm keep expanding it. My proposal is like next week. So I'll talk about this and some other cool stuff we do with compression. 
in, in real hardware. Okay, then thank you guys and good luck.